we are at the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, and we're going to be talking to you today about our Sotal Scholars Program at our university, which is teaching centered, and how we've been working on building those small significant networks. So we will introduce ourselves a little bit later when we get to our um, to our uh, Sotal Scholars work, but we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we've structured this program um, and the theory behind it. So Robert, if you could go to the next slide. Our goals today, we're going to become oriented to small significant networks and the design of the UMW Sotal Scholars Program. We're going to listen to some explanations from Sotal Scholars about their projects and experiences within the small significant network. And we're going to close with a group discussion today about sustainably building small significant networks at teaching centered institutions and beyond. So while our context is teaching centered, we recognize that not all of you might be teaching centered. And so we will create space for all of those voices during our, our um, discussion for the last 20 minutes of this panel today. So to start with, I wanted to give you a brief orientation to the theory of small significant networks and the exact structure of the UMW Sotal Scholars Program. Before we get started, a question I had for you, and you can feel free to unmute or type in the chat, where does some of our most meaningful learning occur? I know for me, as you're thinking about this, what comes to mind is these moments where you meet someone at a conference in the hallway and you start talking about, oh wait, I'm struggling with that problem of practice too. Or you reach out to someone that you know from the university and you say, I need some help thinking through this. And sometimes for me, that one-on-one -on -one is the most powerful way that I've gotten to, to learn something or to think about something in a different way. So I wanted to open the floor for some of your experiences. What have been significant networks you've built for your own learning in whatever context you bring to the table? I'll jump in and say that I find it fascinating to communicate with others who have shared interests or shared passions, but especially when those shared interests kind of have a slightly different spin. So we might be talking about the same topic, but I can learn a little bit from a different perspective. That is definitely some of the um, strongest learning opportunities for me. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that, Melissa. And I see we have a comment in the Chat, reflection first, discussion second. That's a great point too, yeah. So making sure that we're thinking about it ourselves and then we're reaching out to other people. I'm seeing informal conversations with instructors, yes, from different disciplines and levels. So even beyond our own context, sometimes we can have some important insights beyond that. So some of what I'm describing here actually does align with this theory of small significant networks, those small group discussions with others. So the definition of this comes from a 2009 piece. They're permeated by trust. They have an intellectual component of problem solving or idea testing, and they're private only involve a few distinct individuals without signs of boundaries surrounding them. So from what you all shared via speaking or typing in the chat, I didn't hear anyone saying, oh, we meet every, 12, every day at 12 and we sit and talk about what's going on. They're a little bit more organic than that. Um, but the trust, the intellectual component, and the privacy are key components of small significant networks. Next, what we're going to look at is how small significant networks relate to institutional change. And this comes from the work of Williams and their team. But there's three different levels here, the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level. The micro level is where instructional faculty or students are located. These are the people who are actually doing the work, especially when participating in a community of practice. So these are the people who are actually teaching and instructing. At the meso level, we have have this idea of middle management that might include deans, department chairs, and centers for teaching, where we interpret decisions and communicate them. So the meso is sometimes the conduit between the macro and the micro. And then the third level there is the macro level, which is the overarching instructional, the institutional strategy for the whole institution. When we're thinking about institutional change on this next slide here, there are a couple of different levels here. At the micro level, if we, yes, so this is the small significant networks we just talked about being small, trusted, and private networks. This is where some change occurs. At the second level here, the 
Sorry, we're going back and forth here. Sorry, Robert, I'm not giving you very clear signals. We can stay on this number two slide. Um, so the, if you can, thank you. Sorry for the delay there. Um, so the micro level is going to have impacts because this is where the individuals doing the work are located, but the impact of the meso and the macro level is we have to have academic cultures, which is where the macro and meso level interact, that are supportive of SOTL to support the conversations about SOTL that are happening at the micro level. So the question we're going to look at today is how do these three levels interact? How can we use these interactions to create small significant networks and institutional change? There's especially powerful work in the literature here between the meso and the micro level, so the second level and the base level where the instructors are. That's particularly powerful because we need to have interactions between networks and not just within them. I know uh, I've personally had experiences where my insular group knows about something, but then I talk to someone else beyond my group and they have no idea. And this is a great case for social work, where if we're just doing this in our own little silos and our own little islands, we're not going to lead to institutional change. And there's another aspect here of where the leadership occurs. You might have local leaders within the individual instructors on that micro level. You might have appointed leaders that go between those different areas as well. And so what I am going to be sharing with you all today, I actually am kind of, I have a foot in both worlds. I wear the full-time instructional faculty hat, but I'm also here as the faculty fellow with our Center for Teaching that does the work with SOTL. So I've become that appointed leader for SOTL work at our institution at this time with my feet both in the micro and the meso levels to try to look towards how can we really elevate the SOTL work that our faculty are already doing. On the next slide here, we're going to talk a little bit more about institutional change. It can occur the most when we support these small significant networks. We are on the ground as instructional faculty doing the social work. The change at the institutional level needs to come when we're supporting these small groups of faculty working together to really dig into what does social mean for them. Their wooden pool also suggested a couple other questions that I think we can discuss today in our time together too. First, how do we identify these emergent SOTL leaders? How do we nurture them at this small significant network level? How do we support the work that they're already doing and at the meso level start to infuse scholarship into the small network discussion? So that's kind of the scaffold towards the next level. So I'm going to share with you a little bit today about the SOTL Scholars Program that we started at UMW, the University of Mary Washington. First, some context for the University of Mary Washington. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are located in Fredericksburg, Virginia, about 50 miles away to the south of Washington, DC. That's about 80 kilometers for those of you using metric. We are a teaching-centered public liberal arts institution. So that means teaching is at our core. We were literally founded in 1908 as a teacher prep institution for women. And so our devotion to teaching has been the entire span of our existence. We currently have three colleges with about 50 majors and 41 minors. Those three colleges are the College of Arts and Science, the College of Business, and the College of Education. We have around 4,000 undergraduate students, and we do have four graduate programs at this time, but our main focus is on serving our undergraduate students. And another thing to note is that all of our courses are taught by instructional faculty or staff. We do not have any graduate assistants that are teaching for us at the university. So we are all in that micro level. We are all faculty and staff that are teaching at the university. So next we're going to present to you a little bit about the SOTL Scholars Program. This is something we have just started piloting. So some of our presenters here today on this panel are part of the very first SOTL Scholars group. I'm so excited that you're going to get to learn from them today because they are an amazing group of individuals. We've piloted this as a three semester cohort model. In the spring, this past spring, we started it as an orientation to SOTL where we started brainstorming projects and walking through the IRB process. So the question that we were talking about a minute ago about how do we locate and support and infuse scholarship into this model, this was where we were looking in spring 2021. In fall 2021, the main goal is project implementation. Not all of our projects are at the implementation point at this exact phase. Some people are waiting till the spring to do that, and that's fine. We're meeting people where they are. But the main goal for the fall is supporting people with the project implementation, which includes things talking about 
data analysis, which might be outside of some of our Social Scholars primary areas of focus. And then in spring 2022, we're going to be preparing for public scholarship by supporting our Social Scholars with writing groups and presentation support. So that within this three semester cohort, we have given our SOTL scholars a background in what SOTL work is. We've given them support to actually implement the project and we're giving them support to share it widely since that public facing aspect is an important part of SOTL. To become a member of the SOTL scholars program, there was an application process that involved a letter and then we in the teaching center, um, we assessed these letters on a rubric to make sure that they were meeting the expectations of the SOTL we originally designed this for five participants. We accepted all 11 applications that we received because they were such high quality applications and we really did want to be able to support and build on this excitement for social work at the university. What I'm really excited about as well is we had representation across all three colleges and multiple programs within the College of Arts and Sciences. So when we talk about interdisciplinary work, this group is the poster for the interdisciplinary social work. Participant benefits, we promise to provide support and feedback that's personalized to each person's project, including support with IRB, which sometimes can be a pretty overwhelming uh, prospect. We promise to walk along, provide feedback along that route. We also are providing um, funding for, we're supporting finding internal and external presentation and publication venues, so I, I share um, things that we might consider for future journals. And then we also offer $500 to cover project related conference registration fees. Um, we'll talk more about the funding at the end if people have questions about that. I know that is a, a big discussion among center, centers for teaching. This was funding that was already in existence and not being used very well for a different grant and we just reallocated it towards this group. <laughs> And there were some commitments that participants had to make. That was to complete a SOTL project, to attend one meeting a month, which leads to about three to four meetings a semester, and we've asked that there be a final product presentation at a Center for Teaching event in spring of 2022 to share this fantastic work with our peers. So that being said, that's a quick look at UMW, who we are, and what our SOTL Scholars Program is. And next, what I wanted to take some time for us to do is to actually get to hear from our SOTL scholars themselves. So on this next slide, I have a brief description of the projects here, but I'm going to invite our SOTL scholars to tell us a little bit about their project, but more importantly, what has being a member of this small significant network meant for your personal participation in SOTL work. I do I have one participant who is balancing classes today, and I, not, I cannot open the participants list without my computer crashing. Is Alex already here? If not, Melissa Jenkins, you were doing a great job of monitoring that participant list. If you could just let me know if and when Alex is able to join, and if she's not, she's given me um, some, some thoughts to share with you all. So otherwise, let's just go ahead down the list. So I'm going to start with Kate. Will you tell us briefly about your project and what being a member of this small significant network has done for you as a social researcher? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm in the Department of Theater and Dance. I teach mostly acting classes. And so my project was look at the intersectionality of acting and empathy levels um, to see on a wider scale, are we bringing and teaching empathy to the global citizenship of our students? Um, it's been really great to do. Uh, I had never done an IRB and many other things because we do not do them in our discipline. And so I learned a lot. Um, and so far I have some uh, survey responses coming in, but I'm not at the point of having any sort of results to report out. Um, in terms of this group, talking to folks from other disciplines has been so amazing. Um, ideas from other disciplines that have come that I wouldn't have thought of, uh, ways of framing things, and just having a cohort of support to do something that is new to me, that is not something that I usually do in my practice has been really wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Gonzalo, would you like to go next? Sure, I try to be uh, brief. So there's three things I would like to mention. My background, uh, my study, and then my experience with the group. My background is I teach beginning Spanish uh, every semester, and one of the most common challenges is because it's a required class, I have a lot of uh, 
a general lack of interest and motivation from the students. So what I've been trying to do, of course, all these years is to try to uh, engage more. And in one of the conversations that I've had with them, a, a frequent conversation, uh, I realized that some of them are student athletes and that I started to think that uh, there's a very close connection between learning a language and learning a sport. And so what I want to do is to exploit that connection um, and basically mimic or evoke the sports metaphor in the classroom. Um, and, but in doing so, uh, I have, I have uh, some challenges. Uh, one is to find the time to do a study like this because it's, a li it's quite different from my, what I usually uh, do for research. Um, and second is my own lack of expertise in the area. Again, um, this is not my area, so it would be hard to start, it, it, uh, to start something like this on my own. And finally, uh, maybe not a minor thing, is the issue of legitimate uh, validation and legitimacy within uh, my peers and, in a way, within my institution. And this is not something that, uh, uh, it's not a threat, uh, but it's something that junior faculty, I'm an assistant professor, or people with not, without a tenure track contract uh, have to think a lot about. Uh, once you have tenure, it, it, you don't have, probably don't think about it as much. Um, so that was that was another issue. So it, the question is uh, how how did my participation in this group influence my solo work? Well, first of all, uh, it, it made me accountability, uh, which is important because it's again uh, everything else seems a priority. So having a group uh, to work with uh, in this project uh, helps find the time. Um, of course, the expertise and support from uh, from Melissa, right, um, but also from my colleagues, um, and then finally the uh, professional development and validation. That means uh, my original fears that this was not very professional from from uh, from uh, what I uh, from for from where I come uh, has pretty much gone, and now I can see I can more easily appreciate how important this type of research is. Much much more so than before. Uh, and of course, the, the experience of working with my colleagues in my own institution has helped me understand uh, and see very clearly that we all face very similar challenges in the classroom, which was one of the first things uh, I, that I think we noticed when we started meeting. So uh, to, summary, uh, to summarize it, uh, participating in this group uh, has provided me with accountability, uh, support, and, and by support, I told me only emotional support, which is important, but also just the expertise, and of course, uh, validation. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Um, is Alex here? I have not seen her come in. Okay, so we'll hold off on Alex and we'll keep on going. And if she's not able to join us, I will share some of the things that she sent to me. Um, Kevin. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes. <laughs> um, so my research is really looking at uh, some emerging research that's coming out. It's kind of been around for a little bit, but it's still rolling out into higher ed is how are we leveraging higher, high, high leverage practices in our classrooms. Uh, and so I'm really looking at how do we implement those learner centered to universal design things to try to find ways to um, essentially teach future educators how to do the things that we're talking about that they should be doing in their classrooms. Uh, so it's been kind of a fun project to, to think about. Uh, and for me, this group's been, been excellent. Um, I'm a relatively new faculty member at UMW. Uh, when I joined uh, SOTO, I was in my second semester. Uh, so it's been great having the support from some of my other colleagues who are further along in their careers at UMW to hear feedback from them uh, and get that additional support uh, and, and get my, my feet planted. Uh, at UMW and learning the process and what's our IRB look like and those pieces. So it's been a really great uh, process to have that support that wraps around you uh, as you get started in this process. Thanks so much, Kevin. Melissa. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Melissa Jenkins. I am an assistant professor in the College of Education. And like Kevin, my area of focus is special education. And my research, um, particularly related to SOTL, aligns a lot with my background as a former special educator um, and an administrator in schools where I recognize that a lot of our 
educators are not feeling particularly confident, especially in the early stages of their career, about making some of the critical and legal decisions that relate to special education. So the project that I designed is focused on using collaborative case study meetings, essentially mock meetings of what educators will be involved with in schools to give them the opportunity to put our content related to assessment and law and so forth into kind of a real and meaningful practice and also to have opportunities to engage in discussion with their peers as they think about moving into these real world experiences. So what I'm really looking at is the role not only of using the case studies but also of using these mock meetings to build confidence in our pre-service and in some cases practicing teachers as they consider the professional decisions that they will have to make um, in their future careers. So my project is well in progress now. We are in the uh, data collection phase, which is exciting. Um, getting some interesting results back that I can just see anecdotally. I haven't done any data analysis, but I'm looking forward to the outcome. Um, in terms of the impact on me, first I want to say that just doing this process and thinking through the steps of creating this research with a focus on um, my process and teaching it and how I would measure outcomes while also integrating it into course assignments has been really helpful. So thinking about it through the SOTA lens kind of shifted my thinking a bit, which is really positive. And then in terms of the group, I want to kind of echo a little bit about what Kevin said. Um, I am fairly new to the university. I came in just as COVID-related protocols essentially shut us down from being an in-person institution for quite a while. And so having the opportunity to engage with this small um, private collaborative group was really a positive way for me to connect with the larger community outside of the College of Education. And so that um, was a very positive thing. Also, uh, the fact that we are learning from each other, and as a teacher educator, it's really fascinating for me to hear about the ways that all of us across our different disciplines have similarities in the things that we are striving to engage our students in, the questions and concerns that we have. And so very often we can come up with kind of cross-disciplinary ways of addressing shared concerns, which has just been both fascinating from the perspective of a teacher educator, but also really informative as we begin thinking about our own practices. Thank you so much, Melissa. And to echo something that Melissa just said, the importance of us all learning from each other, I think is a really big part of this group. And I'll share a little bit more about that from my experience as the facilitator after we've heard from our SOTL scholars. So next up, Maya. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, so I am trying, but not succeeding in turning my camera on. Um, so I will just talk through uh, the, um, uh, both my SOTL project and the impact of the project uh, that, that it's had on me. So my SOTL project um, stems from my teaching. I teach in the Department of English and Linguistics, where I specialize in teaching early modern drama, specifically the work of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. My SOTL project is titled Intersectionality and Inclusion in the Shakespeare Survey Course. I developed this project as a way to address students' anxieties around studying early English literature, which they often find difficult to grapple with and less relevant to their lives than contemporary writing, and which has led to an attrition in the number of students who sign up for courses in early literature. I hypothesized that addressing topics like gender, sexuality, race, disability topics that students likely engage with every day might help make Shakespeare more relevant and timely for them. Um, this project would not exist without the cohort of SOTL scholars. While I have written about teaching Shakespeare elsewhere, my writing has been uh, very much 
thought about measuring its effectiveness in concrete and systematic ways. And that's what this cohort has done for me. Um, so I'd like to address three ways in which this group has informed my research. Um, first, I want to think about um, developing research questions. This was one of our um, first, uh, one of the first conversations we had when we gathered together in the spring, um, because I I thought about teaching, but I hadn't really considered ways to measure the impact of my methods on student learning. So the first step for me was considering um, which courses I was teaching and what my learning outcomes might be and how to assess their successes or failures. Um, this group also helped me think about how to measure the helped to do that. Again, this was completely new to me. And finally, I haven't been used to thinking about um, the text that students produce as data. And so collecting and assessing data, um, going through an institutional review uh, board application process, um, and uh, starting up a plan to start collecting student work has been a really important part of um, participating in this group. Um, in terms of impact, this has really revolutionized um, the way I teach and think about teaching the Shakespeare survey. Um, it's really um, compelled me to change um, my syllabus and the strategies I use to teach this course that I've been teaching for over a decade. Um, and listening to and working with members of the group has um, really helped me. All right. Thank you so much, Maya. That was great. And then um, just a quick participant check. Um, Melissa, has Alex been able to join us? I haven't seen her come in. Okay, so we'll plan on going to Robert and then I will um, I will share for Alex. So Robert, will you share your experience? Sure, and since I'm screen sharing, I'm gonna try turning on the camera. If it starts doing anything weird, I might turn it back off again. So just so I can, uh, so I can talk a little bit more directly. But hi, I'm Robert Wells and I teach music theory at UNW. And my study is looking at teaching strategies in an entry level music theory course, which is actually designed for students with no prior music theory experience. So students can come from all different majors and take this music theory course and learn how to read music, build harmonies and so forth. Um, the issue I run into in teaching this course is the subject matter is really abstract. And so what I'm looking at is the impact of using more physically based or embodied models and methods and tools, uh, looking at the impact that has on student learning of this material. Um, I'll also be looking at the relative effectiveness of these embodied teaching strategies compared to other more traditional techniques like uh, things like verbal lecture explanations, uh, more static visuals like PowerPoints and handouts, and then auditory musical examples. And my thought was with this project that it would have applications to other disciplines beyond music theory, such as math or other quantitatively uh, based sciences even. Um, as far as the being part of the Sotal Scholars Group, for me, it's really helped me kind of get over the fear of delving into this new scholarly discipline. Um, because one of the things I've been just reflecting on recently is all of us are used to being experts in our specific discipline, but entering Sotal, um, it's almost like we're going back to being novices again. Um, and so having other people who are in the same boat has really helped me kind of have the courage to move forward with a project like this. And even little things like the IRB, because um, like like Kate, uh, my discipline doesn't really typically use uh, study, typically doesn't do studies that require an IRB. So, I mean, that alone might have been enough to kind of make me think, oh, I don't know that I have the uh, ability to do a project like this. Um, even that little barrier, just being able to have other people who are going along, uh, learning this for the first time with me. It really gave me the momentum to kind of get over that little bit of fear, that little hump that I would have otherwise had. Um, so that was probably for me the biggest thing is just having that group support and feeling like I'm not alone in learning these new ways of doing research or learning this new discipline. Thanks so much, Robert. So I'm going to wrap up the Sotal Scholar share today with a message from Alex, who is our Sotal Scholar, who is in the middle of several teaching obligations today. And she did send me um, a statement just in case she would be unable to actually join us. But um, a little bit about her project, Alex is using a pretest post-test experimental design to collect student reactions and learning about a scenario planning activity. Students in the control group, which is one class section, will complete attitude surveys at the beginning and end of class. And students in the experimental group, which is another class section, will complete the surveys along with the scenario 
portfolio planning activity. Typically used in organizations as an exercise for anticipating changes during strategic planning, the scenario planning activity asks students to think about what could happen. This, um, I, I'm getting some disconnected messages. Can you all hear me? Yes. OK, perfect. The students will imagine possible futures and brainstorm implications and actions. Alex's hope is that this scenario planning activity increases resiliency and other positive student attitudes when thinking about the future. If so, instructors could use this activity to help students gain confidence and take control when thinking about their future, create a plan and understand alternatives for when they do face failure and reduce the with the unknown of the future. I also asked Alex to talk about some of the benefits she's experienced with being a member of the Sotal Scholars Cohort. And she says that one of the main benefits of the Sotal group at UMW is that it has allowed me to get to know colleagues across the university. Our meetings have allowed me to hear about various teaching techniques and ideas they might use that I hadn't thought of before and can incorporate into my own classroom. Another main benefit is the accountability that comes with knowing you will be asked to share updates on your progress during our meetings. While everyone is supportive, you don't want to be the one with no update. At a, small teaching, in, at a small teaching university, it is easy to put teaching responsibilities like class prep, grading, and student meetings first and research second. This group has kept me honest and helped me make sure I'm making progress on a research project that will help me with tenure and various publication options. She says she's very thankful. And the last thing I did ask Alex to speak to is in some of our SOTA work, she is a member of our College of Business. She's our only um, SOTO scholar from the College of Business. Um, we'll talk about this at your institutions as well, but in our case here at Mary Washington and other institutions in the area, sometimes it can be really hard to engage in SOTO work specifically in the College of Business because of expectations of what counts as research and accreditation and things like that. So I asked Alex to speak to that as well. And she says she's lucky to work in a business and defines research in a variety of ways. Recently, we were discussing our mission and vision statements for the College of Business and AACSB reaccreditation, and they realized that our focus is on teaching, and they actually voted as a whole college to align more with that mission. For reaccreditation, they earned points to remain in good standing as a scholarly academic, so now they actually are awarded the highest number of points for publishing an article or case study in a top tier pedagogical peer reviewed journal. This completely changes the faculty strategies for publishing and has emphasized pedagogical research in COB, the College of Business. So everything she does in our group with the Soto Scholars will help her achieve tenure because of this new policy, which is important because the AACSB, the accrediting body for business, does not discourage pedagogical research. The college just needs to be able to show how doing pedagogical research aligns with their mission, vision, and strategic plan. So that's something I wanted to highlight. Um, with other work with Centers for Teaching, if you are in a situation where College of Business can be a little difficult, um, there are ways to actually change the, the culture. Um, I think I see I have a hand up from Melissa Jenkins. That is me. We have a question in the chat where a participant is asking um, how we went about finding literature to back up our intervention and research questions. And I know there's a little bit of a lag in the chat, so I'm not clear if she's asking about one of our specific projects or just in general. And I thought maybe this would be a good opportunity for some of us to talk about whether we were kind of specifically focused on um, traditional literature review related to our field or whether something came in that was unique to SOTL in our, in our literature reviews. If anyone wants to jump in, surprise question there. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Well, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so for my project, even though it's very music theory based, I've actually been delving into some literature from like mathematics pedagogy, um, just because I'm dealing with a quantitative discipline and how um, different ways of kind of physically representing abstract processes. And so a lot of what I've been seeing in the mathematical literature is actually really relevant to music theoretic literature. So, I mean, I have still been looking at some of the music scholarship, but delving beyond that into math and even um, some quantitative sciences um, has 
it's really kind of taken me out of my box a little bit with what I'm used to <laughs> used to doing for research. So a little bit of delving into different fields as well as general SOTL scholarship. Any other SOTL scholars have a response they'd like to share about finding literature? I will say that as a teacher educator, there was a very natural connection to the concepts of SOTL, but also um, specifically reading SOTL literature and understanding that there are um, broader pedagogical issues that relate was an interesting part of my um, project. But overall, it was a very nice fit to kind of more traditional um, literature review for me. And I see Maya has a hand up. Yeah, so uh, I think my journey was um, a little um, a, a little bit of a challenge because um, I, I couldn't quite find a, a fit between social scholarship and um, traditional sort of teaching scholarship. And so um, what help was what was helpful for me was blending the two um, disciplines. And so with social scholarship, I was looking a lot at Nancy Chick and um, other collaborators that she's worked with on the teaching of literature and um, the ways in which we can do social work around the teaching of literature. Um, and then I was drawing on um, what uh, what is being discussed in terms of uh, teaching in the in the field of Shakespeare studies and um, strategies and methods um, to enhance uh, student engagement with Shakespeare. So I was trying to bring um, these two conversations together as I was developing research questions in my project. Thank you, Maya. Gonzalo? Yeah, I was just looking for my camera. I think I'm, I'm miserable now. So that that's a good question because uh, not be in my field, it was incredibly hard to just uh, to know how to get started. And we actually had a session for this. And that was our last session, Melissa, right? Yeah. Exactly how to find literature. Uh, and that that really that really helped. Um, so what I what I found what I found so far mostly related to related to what I'm trying to do has to do with uh, mindset, Carol Dweck's mindset uh, as applied to language learning and also class participation. So uh, those two types of research uh, have been very informative about what, uh, for, for what I want to do. Thank you, Gonzalo, for sharing that. And I'll speak a little bit to what Gonzalo just referenced. Our first official meeting of the semester was in September. And in that session, I invited the SOTL scholars to start thinking about where might you want to share this research and what are some of the articles in that publication that could help you with your background, with your lit review and things like that. And I am scaffolding this in a little bit more of a cyclical process where I have no expectation that the SOTL scholars have 100% of their research and lit review done before they're starting their projects because they all have background they're bringing to the table. They're going to keep finding other resources as they're doing this work. Um, so that's part of the writing process that we'll, we'll consider as well. But um, I'm part of the SOTL Collaboratory here in Virginia, and that website is housed at James, nope, sorry, I get these mixed up, GMU, which is George Mason University, and there are some resources there with links for um, SOTL-focused journals and things like that. So I was able to share some of that with our SOTL scholars so that they could have a source to find some resources that are focused on SOTL in particular. And I think I saw another question. My chat has been doing weird things, so apologies on this. But I think we also had a question about what was our background prior to the work we're doing right now as SOTL scholars? What background did any of you have with SOTL before starting this adventure in spring of 2021? Is anyone willing to speak to that? Very little. Uh, my background, uh, I had done one study on, 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 I had one study on classroom research, and that was a few years ago, and it was incredibly labor intensive. Um, but it was not focused so much on the, even though it was about the classroom, the, the, the measure that we were, uh, what we were trying to measure was how much students improve their pronunciation, for example. Uh, this project to me feels very different. It's more about the student's behavior and um, an attitude. So, but that's how how close I I was to this type of project. But it was it was still different. Thank you, Gonzalo. Sure. Anyone else? 
What experience did you have with SOTL before joining this group? Um, I had no experience with SOTL. I, my research has been on the production and practice of theater, um, acting, directing, and somewhat pedagogy, but not in terms of student research or research on um, classroom practices particularly. I also have a lot of qualitative um, response and not much in terms of quantitative data because that's not usually how um, our field talks about um, acting and directing and, and the craft. Um, so this was all very new to me um, in terms of um, actual structure and the um, kind of journals that were available. And I did also have to go outside of my discipline in order to um, kind of collect and craft the project that I was doing to circle back to the last question. Um, so. Thank you, Kate. Anyone else? Um, I guess for me, um, I didn't have any experience with SOTL as an, uh, as an interdisciplinary field. The only experience I had was in music theory pedagogy. Um, I mean, I'd been to some conferences and sessions where there are emphasis on pedagogy within music theory, but I'd never seen anything where you're looking at how does something like music theory impact another discipline's teaching and learning or vice versa. So that, was, that aspect was completely new for me, um, kind of thinking interdisciplinarily. And that's one reason why we actually did start the Sotal Scholars cohort is because we are a very teaching-centered institution, but the specific language of Sotal is something that's relatively new to us. I'll share more about that in just a minute. I'll let Maya share what she was hoping to share. Um, just to add to what everybody else has said, uh, definitely new to uh, the teaching, the, the scholarship of uh, teaching and learning. Um, I Again, it, in my field of Shakespeare studies, it's um, it's uncommon to, uh, to talk about um, IRB and to get um, informed consent to think about student meetings. Uh, so. It's a process for Production sure, experience. and that's something that um, we wanted to, with this program, anticipate some of those roadblocks. IRB is one that I think every Sotal scholar in this group will, will smile and shudder a little bit at. Um, we have a very stringent process at our university, so that's, this caused a little anxiety, and I believe we actually determined anxiety was the word of the semester in spring 2021 from our work in this group, which I think is important to acknowledge that this work can put us in an uncomfortable places, especially when we're new to that and I think that's the power of the private trusting network of a small significant network is that we know we're going to make it through together we're not going to be judged for asking questions that to us might sound a little silly um, but everyone's learning this together so I think that's a, a big outcome there um, for me as the moderator of this group um, like we said earlier Sharing amongst each other, I think, is a particularly powerful way that this is phrased. Um, I don't have to be the expert in everything that we're talking about. Everyone is able to bring their own expertise to our group and to learn with and from each other. So while it's important to me that I make sure I have clear goals, because time is precious in higher education, as we all know, um, we can meet those goals together. So for example, this afternoon, we're gonna be talking about some qualitative research methods, and the Soto Scholars don't know this yet, but they're going to be asked to share some of their own personal experiences with their own data collection that they might have had, because we all do have a lot of experiences to share. So in our remaining time left, I want to open this to discussion with our panel. Um, I have a few questions to, to focus our conversation. So Robert, if you could go to that next slide for us. Um, the main question that we're looking at, and I have some smaller questions here, is how are we going to build these sustainable, small, significant networks at teaching-centered institutions and beyond? So the first thing I'd love to hear from some of our participants here is what initiatives at your university have you started? Started to develop these small significant networks and what's been successful or what challenges have you faced in that? How are you trying to build these small significant networks in your own context to promote social work? Feel free to unmute or to type in the chat. We'll provide lots of wait time because we know how these uh, platforms are. It sometimes takes a minute to get technology working or get our ideas typed out. But we're thinking about what initiatives has your university done already to support these building of small significant networks? Good morning. Uh, may I go first? 
Of course. Yeah, uh, Julia So from UNM Valencia campus. We are one of the four branch campuses of uh, University of New Mexico in New Mexico. And uh, when I I started a Soto reading club in my division back in the summer of 2018. And that is, in my division, we have nine disciplines and 21 faculty members, both full-time and part-timers. And that's the focus I want. And then the following fall, by end of 2019, I wanted to expand the reading club campus-wise because clearly nobody knows what SOTL is. <laughs> so I knew that this would be a huge challenge and I spoke with the director of teaching and learning and she was very accepting and collaborative and then we launched it campus-wide. So since then, campus-wide, every month we meet once a month and then we discuss SOTO journals. And the good part is because it's multidisciplinary. So my challenge is really, but I took it upon myself though, is to make sure that everything we discuss can cross discipline and not just mm -hmm. focus on social science or math or anything else. So that worked out well. The only thing is participation is not as enthusiastic as I want, but I was constantly reminding myself that something that I heard years ago that good things start small. So even if three people, five people is fine. I do have loyal faculty members. I have three that constantly comes every month, which is good. So my question to the panelists and Melissa as well, or anybody can jump in is, what would potentially be my next step? Our campus is very small. We have 2,000 students. And uh, to do a scholar program, I think is a little bit overreached. Maybe just asking for volunteers or things like that. So that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> Let me turn oh, off my yeah. video now. That's a great question. Thank you. Was someone else speaking? Sorry. All good? OK. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. Sorry, my computer is doing some wild things over here. Um, but Julia, I put in the chat, good things start small. I think things do start small. And I think it's important to remember that those small efforts are still making progress. And to make you feel better, Julia, we actually started the first thing I did as a SOTO scholar. Nope, so, sorry, I'm not a SOTO scholar. A faculty fellow um, with a focus on SOTO is I also started a faculty reading group. We are reading, the book is behind me over here. I know my camera's off because of my wild internet, but I am holding it in my hand. It's engaging in the scholarship of teaching and learning by Bishop Clark and Dietz Oller. Um, that was a book that we started a, a small group reading group on and I agree Julia I faced the same thing where the participation was less than enthusiastic um, it also was right around COVID so that did not help our retention either so we backed up and realized that this wasn't working for us and so we we stepped back to think about what are some of the barriers faculty are facing I know for me personally it's time and so we realized that for social work to really be supported at our institution we needed to make sure we were creating a structure that could give faculty the protected time they needed to do this. So that's mm -hmm. one thing I think, Julie, that's a helpful starting point is to think about what are faculty's barriers to SOTO and how can we use even limited resources um, at an institution that's smaller like yours with 2,000 students to try to protect faculty to actually create space to do the work. And I see Gonzalo has something to add too. Yes. Um. So I think what I'm trying to think of why why I joined this group, given that we all have so little time. And I think from the very beginning, Melissa, it was uh, it felt to me like very well scaffolded. So the first task that we had for any of us who were interested was to write a proposal, and that that that's really what helped me uh, start thinking about what I wanted to do. I mean, I had the idea in my mind, but the, the the little homework, which is writing the proposal, already got me started. And, and the way the, the call was made, um, we we've, I felt protected, if you want, that, that can be a word. Because you design it in such a way that you said this is going to take over three semesters. Um, and it 
the idea has always been from beginning to end. Um, and hopefully I can finish the project in next spring. I, I don't think so. I think it's going to be a much longer project there than I thought. But I, I did start with the, with the belief that we were going to be able to, um, to get to something close to completion. And I think that helped. Um, and so, and I, if I remember it correctly, you, the first semester was meant to just learning about subtle. The second one was implementation of the study, and then the third for something like uh, analysis of the results. So that, that idea, even though I'm, I'm only doing pilot data now, that idea uh, helped me uh, jump on the boat, if you want, um, and get into something completely new and something that, uh, that I thought it was still uh, worth doing, of course, but I, that I wasn't going to do by myself. I think that was... That was for me the key difference. And I think it's all raising a, a few really important points here. Um, yes, I will. I will work on typing the title of the book in the chat. Um, so the the main thing is that community where we're not alone. I feel like for me, that's something I still want to do here at Mary Washington. Is I know these eleven fabulous people who are in our cohort. I know not all of them were able to join today, but we do have eleven total. I know they're doing total work, but I don't know who couldn't join the group but is still doing social work like we need to do a little bit better with networking and building that community of people who are doing the work at Mary Washington um, that's one of my big goals uh, going forward here but also again looking at the resources our center for teaching is small we have one full-time person that's it and that person's responsibilities mean that they cannot necessarily commit to doing social work and so that's my project as a faculty fellow um, where I'm teaching full-time but I'm also devoted to to building this so I think you also have to, to think about what resources do you have available um, how can you create a scaffold and a structure like Gonzalo is saying but also recognize this work is messy so even in my long-term plan of we're gonna have presentations ready at the end of next spring that's not where we're all going to be and that's okay because we've built this small significant network that we can continue to rely upon. Melissa. I wanted to add that and it kind of connects nicely to what you were just saying Melissa that because we kind of have a group of early adopters and it sounds like that's what you have as well Julia that the work that we do when we kind of wrap up our projects and as we present to our university community even if we present this is where we are and we haven't finished our project, but this is what we've done. I think just disseminating that kind of information um, through a variety of sources, whether we do it through our formal presentations or just in our conversations with colleagues, might be something that helps to expand the discussion of SOTL. Thank you, Melissa. So I have a couple other questions that in our last five minutes here we can consider, but first I wanted to open the floor for if anyone else had any questions that they'd like to bring to the group. I do have one more question, if you don't mind. Of course. <laughs> um, IRB is involved. Was it IRB involved because you are involving students or involving the faculty members? That is a great question. So IRB is involved because we're working with student data and we're disseminating it publicly. So that's something okay. that sets SOTL apart from other work. Of course, we can reflect on our teaching um, without having to get IRB approval, but as soon as we want to be able to share it more widely, which is a central tenet of the SOTL work um, theory, is we have to get approval to work with that student data. So it is because we're, we're working with student data at this point. There are other models where we can just reflect on our teaching and we don't necessarily have to have IRB approval. Um, um, but I was providing support for us to actually look at some student data because this was something that, in my experience, is a little bit scarier and needs a little bit more support. And if our social scholars have that in their back pocket with social science methods and approaches, um, you can you can apply that to all kinds of things. So if any social scholars want to speak to that as well, you're more than welcome to. I just noted in the text, but for most of us, um, we were able to submit either an 
exempt application, which is obviously pretty straightforward, or an, it cert, I think everyone at least was able to do an expedited. So while we're still going through the process, it's not quite as complicated as some of the other options that could occur in IRB requests. And I think it's particularly important to be aware of the sensitive issues because of doing research with our own students. There are some ethical concerns there. We just have to be very careful um, to make sure that we're not uh, putting our students in uncomfortable places as both students and research subjects. So I think that's where a thorough, a careful IRB process can be very beneficial. Um, this is something that in our social collaboratory work across institutions in Virginia, this is a conversation that's ongoing. Um, we've done a pod network, um, which was for audiences across the United States conference a couple of weeks ago with this group as well and concerns that keep arising is how do we support this IRB process when it's institution specific each institution has their own policies and procedures so we can't just create this blanket application that anyone can fill out so that's an ongoing conversation I think that's something as we're continuing to talk about advocacy for social work um, supporting that process to be as transparent and accessible as possible is a huge conversation um, going forward Great question. Anyone have advice for our SOTL scholars in closing here as they are getting ready to embark on their first, most of them, their first official SOTL publication? Anyone have any advice or words of encouragement for our fabulous SOTL scholars? I don't have. Melissa? Gonzalo, are you going to give yourself some advice? Y yes, I can. <laughs> No, it wasn't advice, of course. It was just a final thought. Um, I noticed it from what you read about uh, what Alex said, that there was a common topic what I had thought about, which is um, just maybe the, um, I don't know even how to call it, but like the political aspect of it. Um, especially for people who are in the tenure track, if people without tenure yet, or without a, in a, or not in a tenure track position, uh, it's very hard to try something new when you are in, in that sort of uh, non-tenured um, uh, situation. So a group like this really makes it possible. And this is incredibly important for a research, uh, for a teaching institution like ours, because uh, it, it always makes it stronger, I think, and more coherent when most of our time is devoted to teaching. If research can be directly related to our teaching, it, it, it only makes it better. So I am very grateful that uh, that, that you have uh, created this group. But I think it's only you know, for our own benefit, for the whole university. Thank you, Gonzalo. I agree. I'm, I'm really hopeful that this work continues. Speaking of continuing, if you'd like to continue the conversation, here's the contact information for the people who were able to join us today. Thank you all for your hard work in SOTL. Look forward to continuing these conversations about engaging in advocacy work to continue to build the SOTL cultures at our institutions, especially those that are teaching-centered. Thank you all, and we hope you enjoy the rest of this conference.